So Hong Kong is such a unique, such an interesting, uh, dynamic place to work. It is a place where you can see the expressions of so many cultures um, in one region. And early on, I was encouraged by this idea um, that the earth is but one country and mankind are its citizens. Um, and you can definitely see the seed or the potential for, for the expression of this idea here in Hong Kong. Um, it is an, a, a unique conjunction point between East and West. Um, and also, you know, in deciding to come here, I had uh, the opportunity and the privilege to spend a number of years in mainland China, beginning in the 1990s, and uh, develop some really close friendships and um, a deep appreciation for the spirit of inquiry, the, the concern for development and human advancement. Um, so when this chance came, this opportunity came to teach here in, in Hong Kong, in this region, I was very happy and all my family was very happy for, for us to return uh, to East Asia. Hong Kong U Law uh, continues to make very important contributions to legal scholarship both for Hong Kong, but also for the region as well as globally. Um, it's amongst the most diverse faculties in the world. Um, and it's also privileged to be part of a university, a university environment that's been ranked the most international in the world by Times Higher Education. So that's encouraging um, because I do think it does reflect the, the diversity that you do see here. Um, and this makes it a very dynamic place to be. Um, we're fortunate within the faculty to have over 120 uh, global partnerships in research, in teaching, and also in exchange. And all of this enriches our learning environment. It also enriches the opportunities that our students have um, to develop their legal knowledge and also their understanding of diverse um, systems of law. The students here um, in our law faculty, they are engaged, they are very hardworking, they are so bright. Um, they're concerned about justice, they're concerned about developing themselves and also the community. Um, youth in Hong Kong and also in all countries have a very important um, role to play in advancing our society. Uh, this part of life, this period of life has been described as the choicest time of life when one is preparing for their future, um, and the adaptability, the vitality, the enthusiasm of youth um, puts them in a very unique position to contribute to social betterment and advancement. Um, this also means that educational institutions have a very important role in helping to re release the constructive potential of young people. Um, and we've seen that. Uh, very much play out in terms of what our students have done, how they've worked with our community um, and our faculty members. For example, in one case, um, many students worked together with one of our colleagues, uh, Dora, to develop a web tool to assist landlords and ten tenants um, to enter into fair tenancy agreements. Um, and this is a tool now that's available to anyone who wants to access it. Um, our students have also really worked hard in providing free legal aid for cases that involve contract disputes, uh, custody, elder care issues, um, employment issues. Um, so it's always gratifying to see our students so engaged with our community and um, thinking of new ways and um, constructive ways to help uh, our society, our community uh, become better. My most rewarding experience has, uh, has been seeing my students grapple in class with different ideas, uh, try out, challenge them, and then you know test out these ideas or these skills that they're learning and um, eventually graduate and eventually <laughs> use these uh, skills to contribute somehow to, to their community. And so many of them have gone on to work in the public sector, the private sector, within Hong Kong, within the region. Um, some are teaching at universities in Kenya. Uh, some have worked at the Red Cross, UN Development Program. Um, some have helped to build up and develop arbitral institutions here in Hong Kong uh, with CTAC, with HKIC. Um, also in Mexico with arbitral institutions in Mexico. Um, so overall, I've been just 
so impressed to see the dynam dynamism of our students and also particularly right now during this pandemic um, to see the resilience of our students. Um, it's not been easy, I think, for anyone, um, but we've really seen our students adapt to these online tools, um, become very creative. Uh, in many cases, they know a lot more than I do in terms of the functionalities. We've been able to, uh, fortunately, as a team, learn how to replicate, um, to some extent, some of the interactive dynamic that we had in the classroom. Uh, to some extent in this uh, virtual environment, and that's been a lot of fun uh, to try out these tools and to learn about them uh, together with, with our students. In my free time, once in a while, I do go out uh, road biking with my husband. Uh, we tend to go uh, very early, around 5.30 a.m. when there's less traffic. We have more of a chance of coming back in one piece uh, but it's been a, a, a great way to see Hong Kong and to see it in different, a different light and, um, and to appreciate the, the sort of diverse terrain of the city. So together with some neighbors, we also um, have been creating a space within our neighborhood complex to provide support for children and also junior youth um, education for classes more at the neighborhood level. So this is the, based on this concept that um, individuals, uh, are like a mine rich in gems of inestimable value. And so the idea is to provide a space uh, where we can develop these qualities uh, like ju justice, uh, cooperation, and then apply them in small, very small, modest acts of service within the community. Um, and doing this together with neighbors has definitely given me a sense of optimism and hope about uh, possibilities for for progress and cooperation within our community context. So yes, I have had a chance to work in legal practice as well as um, here within the law faculty for the past 13 years. Um, both are fantastic professions. Um, as a legal practitioner, I always enjoyed um, you know, helping with very specific problems, trying to help solve the problem of various individuals, and also the teamwork that was involved. Um, often these are complex and involve multiple perspectives and um, capabilities. And so that was always very exciting. Um, equally so, working as a professor has been rewarding. Um, it's wonderful to have the chance to investigate new questions, uh, to work with students, to learn with them, um, and to always expand um, our understanding together. You're very kind. Um, so I heard in your interview earlier with Professor Stone Sweet, um, he also mentioned something similar, which is this idea of allocating a certain time, which is your research time. And I try to also do that in the mornings. Um, and make some small step, whether it's um, reading or it's writing up some idea or some bibliography, um, but trying to put a little bit in each day. Um, also enjoy, I think the, the core of it also is really trying to think about a question that hopefully has some benefit, is of some use, is um, will contribute something to inching us a little bit further in, our, in the way that we practice law or understand it. Um, and that itself is a, motiva a motivation by itself. Um, and so I do enjoy what I, what I, what I research, and um, I find the questions interesting, and I hope that they're of some use, of some benefit. I think women in all sectors, in all professions, in all societies, in all, in all corners of the world, um, are really struggling to think about and also men are thinking about how do we apply this principle of equality of women and men. We understand that this principle exists, but what does it mean uh, in practice? And we've had many um, centuries of recorded history uh, where we know and we have many examples of women's uh, sphere of activity being quite limited, quite uh, constrained. And the perception and understanding of women has been one of sort of merchandise, uh, of a commodity, um, 
And so it's not, we're not so far from that history, actually. So um, really now with ed- access to education, women have so many opportunities. And the question is, how do we rearrange our understanding of women's role uh, and re-sort of challenge some of those traditional notions, um, given these opportunities now uh, for, for expression of capability? Um, and so... For me, it's just helped to reflect on this principle of equality and to challenge internally some of my own um, outdated assumptions about how we distribute, for example, functions uh, uh, beyond traditional gender-based lines within the home and also within the uh, professional uh, environment. Um, And I think that this actually offers and serves as a great opportunity, not just for women, but also for men. It means that both men and women have a wider range, a wider sphere of uh, expression um, to to demonstrate a more complete, more holistic um, set of capabilities and capacities. Um, and really what this is uh, driven by is this idea, this understanding that the world of humanity is has been described like a bird. It has two wings. One, is, one side is man, the other side is woman. And not until both are equally uh, developed can this bird fly. And in the same way, not until both women and men are equally, um, uh, that equality is realized, can humanity advance in the way that it needs to. And it's really been heartening to be part of a university as well as a faculty that's really grappling and thinking about these issues um, and making constructive steps to uh, contribute to uh, gender equality, and it's a it's an ongoing, it's a long-term issue. But I know that we have committed uh, members of our faculty, our dean, our head, um, and the university, uh, all working together and thinking about this issue. So that's encouraging. One of my uh, favorite books early on. I think I was about 14 when I read it. It was called The Book of Certitude, and it's by Baha'u'llah. It addresses this question of how do we search for truth? How do we overcome certain veils that might be hindering our understanding, our awareness of reality? Um, and the idea is that this isn't a static you know, process. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. And we're always going to be confronted by veils and by barriers and hindrances, prejudices, um, uh, narrowness, you know, ideas that may, uh, you know, cause us to sort of overlook um, a deeper understanding. And it also helps us to see the idea of truth as sort of a evolving, a a sort of relative and fluid but evolving um, uh, concept. And one that uh, is progressively understood over time. So I, I find that very fascinating, and it's a very deep topic. And um, happy to happy to explore that if ever anyone's interested. But another book that I really enjoyed in relation to the work that I do here is called Non-Zero: The Logic of Human Destiny, and that's by Robert Wright. Um, and this work particularly focuses on a, vari- a, a range of empirical studies, and uh, these studies each show how at different points in civilization's development, each of these are associated with uh, some form of advancement in cooperation and the ability to cooperate. Um, And so I think that really has a lot of insight right now, especially as the world is struggling uh, with so many things. There's so much polarization. There is this uh, tendency to draw back, to kind of recede into uh, groupings and to, to really think about this particular work and what it says about our ability to advance. Our ability to advance is very closely tied to our ability to cooperate. And in fact, it's actually dependent on our ability to cooperate. We cannot inv- advance without it. So I find, I find that book very inspiring and also very helpful in terms of the work, work that I do. In relation to my research, early on, um, I came across this idea that just as in nature, disunity is a cause of disintegration, and converse, the unity, the cohesion of elements is the cause of life and the cause of progress. Um, And so from this idea, I became interested in learning more about how diverse systems 
uh, function with this aim of trying to resolve disputes to uh, restore us to this place where we can continue to function, to continue to operate and think of new ideas and build new things together. So, of course, China has had a long history also in thinking about this question. Um, and so this is why early I was very fascinated by exploring the evolution of systems of dispute resolution within this region. Um, and it continues to fascinate me e even to this day. So within the arbitral institutions here in Hong Kong, within the region, um, there is definitely a growing similarity uh, in terms of the uh, practices, but also some distinctions that we can benefit and learn from. Um, one of the first projects that I wrote up called Resolving Disputes in the Asia-Pacific Region, the key finding was that amongst these diverse arbitral institutions here, um, there is a growing similarity in the substantive law that um, underlies how these uh, op uh, institutions operate, but there is also at the same time space for diversity in practice and diversity in rules, um, which are accommodated um, in a very interesting way by the flexibility of this UN model law structure, which many of the countries in this region are part of, um, which allows a country to opt in or opt out of various provisions based on unique circumstances. Um, and I've really had some very positive experiences interacting with many of the arbitral institutions here, CTAC, HKIC, KCIV, SIAC, all, you know, there's so many, there's a <laughs> plethora, alphabet soup of, of acronyms, but um, each of them really are innovating in their own ways, um, some unique, very um, important advancements within the practice of arbitration and sharing those. Um, and also, this is also influencing how uh, arbitral institutions throughout the world are thinking about efficiency, thinking about questions of, um, you know, uh, uh, emergency arbitration, for example, uh, many of these innovations have really taken on um, great life in this part of the world, and it's, it's been wonderful to see that process here. Um, and also what's interesting, our LLM students have been very much involved in that. I mentioned some of them have gone on to actually head and administer some of these institutions. Uh, we're very proud of them. Um, and when uh, students graduate from our program, uh, they have the opportunity to get certification, for example, with the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators uh, by passing many of our, uh, our core courses with uh, certain grade cutoffs. And many of them have gone on to do that, in fact, um, also become certified me mediators with the Hong Kong um, Mall and to work with many of the institutions within our region. So uh, a few years ago, when we did have the opportunity to travel, to move in and out of Hong Kong, it's funny, it's so long, but um, I did have the pleasure to visit SCIA, <clears throat> and I was very impressed by their facilities. Um, and, and the vision of SCIA as being of service to the greater Bay Area region. Um, one of the staff members, she was very kind, she took me on a tour of the SCIA, and she pointed me to a window, which you could see in a few directions. She pointed in one direction, it was Macau, the other direction was Hong Kong, um, and all of it was visible from its office windows. And <clears throat> I understood then that there, the idea of, of this uh, institution was really to be a place where lawyers, um, arbitrators could work together from Macau, from Ar Hong Kong, uh, within the greater China region. Um, and what's unique and very interesting, I think, opportunity for our students now is to become qualified under new GBA lawyers qualification scheme. So there's an exam, I understand, that's being administered uh, where lawyers can be qualified to function within this very unique uh, space. Um, and similarly, mediators can qualify uh, and register to, to uh, serve on various institutions within the Greater Bay Area region. My advice to students would be um, 
again, first of all, to think about what are your talents, what are you good at, what are you, what motivates you, um, what is it that you love, and ideally how you can place that alongside something uh, that could be a benefit that could help society improve in some way. And then finally to, to knock on a variety of doors uh, with your full heart and then just see which ones open. And when those doors open, to really take the step um, and, and to, to proceed. For our PhD students, um, both those who are considering it but also those who are in, in the program at the present time, um, I would say that it, one of the most important things um, is really to think about the issue, the question that motivates you, that, um, that will keep you up, that will sort of heat up your blood in some way, but not keep you all, <laughs> of course, allowing you to sleep <laughs> in a healthy way, but that really does motivate you. Um, and ideally, that could be of some benefit to, to the community, that could help advance um, either our understanding of how law functions, of how it operates. Um, and then, you know, whether or not it's possible to think about what is the underlying principles that motivate this question. Um, for those seeking a job in the academic market, of course, it's important to start sharing your research uh, through publications, through conferences. Uh, you might consider reaching out individually to people whose work you admire and think about whether it's possible to collaborate um, and, uh, and really put your whole heart into, into your research. So in terms of our LLM program, every year I'm so excited to meet our new cohort. We have such an interesting and diverse range of students who come from so many professional and so many educational backgrounds. Um, and so you are most welcome. If you are watching this, you're thinking or curious about the arbitration program here, um, to check our website um, and see whether or not this program might be of some benefit to you. Um, you're most welcome to uh, be in touch if you have any questions. Um, and possibly we look forward to seeing you here uh, at perhaps not so distant time in the future. Thanks so much.